Welcome to Wild Connection, the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Vertolin. I'm a scientist and author that studies animal behavior. I'm passionate about animals and exploring the complexity of their lives, their intelligence, relationships, families, social connections, and emotions. I also love helping people reconnect with nature to live better lives. This podcast is about you, other animals, and how we're all connected in this wild and crazy thing called life. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Wild Connection, the podcast where I connect you to our natural world through incredible conversations with scientists, authors, conservationists, and well, anyone doing the hard work of communicating about this marvelous planet and all the life forms and systems on it. Speaking of this marvelous planet, Earth Week and Earth Day are coming up, but I'm going to devote the rest of the month to celebrating and reflecting on the beauty and importance of our planet. We kicked off April with Participatory Science and Dr. Karen Cooper. And now we're going to continue with Nathaniel Popkin, author of To Reach the Spring. I interviewed him a few years ago, but I'm always returning to this episode because it was such a powerful conversation. Now, before we get started, I wanted to share a couple pieces of exciting news. I'll soon be heading back to Uganda to continue my work with mountain gorillas, and it's a reminder of how vital this planet is, not just for us humans, but for all of the incredible creatures we share it with. Every species plays a crucial role in maintaining the delicate balance of our ecosystems. I'm also going to be starting to lead tours to Uganda next year, which means you can come with me. So stay tuned for more about that on the podcast, or you can head over to my website, www.jenniferverdalen.com, and sign up for a newsletter that will get you all of the latest and upcoming events and news. Before we jump into the discussion with Nathaniel Popkin, I want to encourage you to subscribe to Wild Connection podcast and share it with your friends and family. By spreading the word, you're helping to amplify our message of conservation and appreciation and connection to the natural world. Together, we can make a difference in protecting our planet for future generations. Okay, it's time to start talking to Nathaniel. Hi, Nathaniel. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jennifer. It's so great to be here. Oh, really I'm, looking forward to our conversation. As am I. I I've, I've been looking forward to this all week. And, you know, as an author, you've written about a range of topics uh, from memory to urban and historical change. And I'm really curious about what motivated you to explore, as you call it, the ecological crisis uh, that we're in and to write to reach the spring? That's a, that's a, a great, uh, and maybe difficult question, but, uh, so I am a, I'm a writer and, um, in my work, I explore, um, themes of memory and loss and history and urban change. Um, and all of that, I think is part of the story here about, um, the way human beings have changed our relationship to the earth and how what we do and what we are doing. Um, it, it, I mean, there's, there, let me, let me restate that there, there's an aspect to what I'm looking at in my work, which is about notions of justice. Mm -hmm. It's a search for knowledge and a search for justice among people and facing up to ecological change, the eco crisis, the climate emergency, what it is we're doing to the other living beings on the planet is in fact a matter of justice. So it fits together um, in some ways with my other work. On the other hand, I've been a lifelong environmentalist ever since I can remember really. Mm -hmm. And I've worked as an environmental activist professionally. Um, but, and that, although that was in many years ago, it's never left me. And so I had to find a way 
to deal with my own thoughts and feelings about this issue that we're facing because it's a it's a consequence of of actions by human beings and since we are moral beings and we think about what we do and how it affects ourselves and other people it's a great weight on our shoulders to know that what we're doing is so destructive Absolutely. and that yeah, and, and that's what i had to i'm sorry that's what i had to kind of like explore it was gnawing at me I can totally relate to that. And and we're going to talk a little bit later about um, lots of things resonated with me in in your book um, to reach the spring, both on the inequality of influence, as you talked about, the concepts of justice and grappling with my own feelings of grief and and. even a conundrum of being human and moving in this world and the impact that I have just by existing uh, on other species, even though I, as an animal behaviorist, uh, an animal uh, lover and uh, my own environmental activism, uh, you know, I'm sort of confronted with that, that issue. And, you know, but one of the things that I really appreciated, one of the many things I appreciated about To Reach the Spring was this message of connection that that kind of permeated the entire book. And this show is about connection, specifically our connection with other species and with nature. And so before we dive you know, into the book, I'm wondering if you have a special way, you know, you've mentioned having always been Uh, an environmental activist and passionate about the environment. Do you have a special way of connecting to nature for yourself? It's a great question. And, you know, really what's, and we'll talk about this, I think a little bit later, you know, that connection is so important for us in terms of finding a way forward, whatever that connection means for each of us. For me, it can mean standing in a meadow it can mean gardening, which I enjoy doing, though don't have access to time or space to do it very often since I live in a city. It means uh, sitting and listening to the birds outside the window. Um, it means hiking a lot and putting myself, um, taking myself sort of out of the constructed human environment and into one that feels at least at least I can pretend anyway, is not constructed by human beings. Um, And, but these things are, they're so important to me. One of my favorite things to do in summer, particularly is to walk in creeks and to like, literally there, there's some um, creeks not far from uh, where I live, where you can just walk into it and then walk along the Creek and on the sides of the creek at that time, you are filled with wildflowers. And so you have dragonflies and butterflies and bees everywhere. <laughs> and that's just a great pleasure that I have. And there's something about standing in the water that sort of takes you out of the usual. You're not used to standing there right. in that kind of circumstance. And so it kind of alters the perspective. Gosh, you know what, what I love about what you just said it was so much, but the diversity of ways that you have to connect, because a lot of times I feel like some people just have a one particular focal point of how they connect with nature. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, but that breadth and that appreciation of a diversity of ways, you know, for me, it can be watching the birds outside the window. It can be walking the same path every day and, and knowing who's where and when and what they're up to that day. It can be, I, I'm very much a fan of dragonflies uh, and, mm-hmm. and butterflies. And, and I think that, you know, then there's that aspect of where I would sit in a meadow and, and watch whatever comes for however long I can be there just to be part of the system of, of individuals that are going about their life that day. Uh, and so I think that being able to appreciate a multitude of ways of connecting is pretty important. Yeah. I mean, I really, uh, you know, I love to stand in place just like you described and just let the things happen around me or 
they just, they're doing their thing anyway, you know, right. <laughs> but, but it's that stillness. And, and there's one other thing that I've been doing. I'm nearsighted and um, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but it kind of plays into it. So I've been doing over the last few years, a, a lot of macro photography. It's just something I do. Um, and it allows me to look closer. I have to like take my glasses off and look closer to be even able to see through the camera at what I'm looking at. And, uh, it really, it, it isolates place and time in, into this like special space outside of everything else. If I want to lose everything, I, I do macro photography where I'm mostly looking at bees and flowers and insects and things growing and getting as close to them. And of course the camera lens is helping a lot. Right. I get as close as I can and, and then everything is happening around you. And it's just, you're waiting for the bee to land. You're watching its movements. You're being able to see all the strange and interesting parts of that animal, which yeah. is a fascinating um, being that, you know, normally we, we, we actually think it's a predator or something horrible, but you know, a lot of us do because we're, people are afraid of getting stung. But when you look at it up close, it's such a beautiful creature. And, um, it, it, and it's, but really what that does is it just draws me away. I, I, it's like stepping out of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when I would do my research, I would go to the same place and I was there to study prairie dogs, but mm -hmm. lots of things come to where prairie dogs live. And, and eventually, and there was a certain, I felt a certain sort of privilege and also, I don't know, honor that everything just said, Oh, it's just that creature. We're not sure what it is, but it just sits there for hours every day. It does. <laughs> right. We right. don't know who we've. <laughs> right. We just did, but they accepted my presence and, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. no longer startled or just kind of, Oh, okay. And, and went about their business. And, and then it was interesting because other animals started to treat me like I was part of the landscape, most notably hummingbirds, which there was one wow. that, that attacked me. <laughs> like, <Wow. laughs> I, it was, I was apparently way too close to its favorite bush. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then a squirrel that pelted me with cones, like, <laughs> like I don't belong under its tree. Excuse me. Well, and that's when, you know, you're, you're really living like, you know, you, you've stepped out of the human there. That's wonderful. It is. And, and that's why I always felt honored when that started to happen. And I became the subject of observation for mm -hmm. other species. I, I was taken aback by not observing that I was being observed by a coyote, just a mere six feet away. From me. <laughs> and I only recognized that it was happening when I stood up and turned around and there it was. And I thought, Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, I've been the observed one now and I don't know what it thought about me, but it clearly, it had been there probably for half an hour, at least based on the prairie dogs. So, wow. yeah. So not necessarily a testament to my observational skills. Um, <laughs> at that time, I was so taken with what was happening in front of me. I didn't even pay attention to what was going on behind me. Well, well that's the thing. And I actually talk about that very thing in this book. It's like, you know, it's impossible to be aware of everything around you. Right. And the, and this is one of the, the things about the Anthropocene is a label. It's a very unidirectional label and it actually belies the reality. I mean, of course, human beings are imprinted in every possible way on the earth. Uh, and so it makes sense, but it also belies the reality, the complicated dynamics of living beings they you know they live outside of us mm -hmm. far more than you know uh w we tell them what to do so um yeah there's just that that th there's so much life out there there is and and then you know that kind of ties to how we feel about how i feel how you feel how many people feel about the changes that we're seeing, the inaction that's happening. And I was really moved. You started the book off with a letter to a future grandchild. <laughs> yeah. And 
I'm wondering, I mean, do you worry about future generations and, and what they're inheriting and how they're going to navigate living on this planet? Oh my God. Yes. I worry about it every day. Um, I worry about it for several reasons. First of all, it's just my kids are 21 and 18. And, um, so the future grandchild is a future grandchild. It's just an imagined person that may or may not exist in some time in the future, but it's believable that it, it might. Right. Um, but you know, for them, being students, being at that stage of life where really everything is in front of you, every, you know, the sort of individual possibility, the, I mean, with this generation of kids, they're really thinking about community and, and the society they live in and how they want things to be. And, you know, they're interested in working towards that, the, their consciousness of social justice issues is just through the roof in terms of just the very basic understanding of the world. And I worry at one level that if they start to think too hard about actually what is likely to happen to the earth in their certain lifetimes, yeah, they could become very despairing. I, I mean, I almost sometimes, obviously my uh, you know, my kids have, have read the book and have been involved in the writing of it in some way or the other. But um, I almost hesitate to like fixate on these issues when I talk to them because I don't want to disturb them that much. I find it disturbing. And so then from a like a, a kind of ethical standpoint, of course, I know that uh, my generation and your generation and those that came before us, we're responsible for this because we've known exactly what it is we're doing. And we're leaving not only this next generation, but the next one after that, and uh, as in the, the grandchild, with something that is terrifying, with, is potentially and almost certainly terrifying at one degree or the other. Uh, and I don't know how we deal with that. I, I just don't. I, I couldn't agree more. And and it made me like, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about when I was 18, right? And when I was 18, I mean, recycling was just getting started. There was a uh, World Wildlife Fund was <laughs> really yeah. big, PETA, right? And, and and all of that was sort of sprouting as I was entering college. And I've, I've always loved animals, like always. And I think I've always talked to them and followed them around <laughs> mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and just to be in their company or presence as a, as an accepted observer or participant in their, in their life. And, and so I was really at that time, uh, so, you know, fired up, uh, I was committed to, um, radical change, right. Of, of what was, happening and how to stop it and deforestation and all of those things that are now, you know, many years later, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing are still <laughs> the issues and, and something that happened to me along the way, which is also something that you talked about. So it resonated with me was this sort of duality of passionately caring about nature and the environment and being committed to advocating for it, but also being stuck or unable to escape being this participant in its destruction. Um, can you share a little bit about how you grapple with this? Yeah. I mean, it's um, an example goes back to the kind of moment that you were just talking about when I was a university student. Um, there was uh, a push to, to, to do a second earth day. The first one had been in 1970 and so it was 1990 and we, I was part of, I was the leader of mm -hmm. an effort on the campus where I went to school to do Earth Day 2. And I, and it was a big deal. And it, but it coincided with this annual ritual on campus, which involves styrofoam hats. <laughs> and the, those two realities were one, which you wanted, you know, you wanted to take part in that, that famous old ritual for the junior class going into senior year in the spring before and celebrate along with them, you know, so there's, so you want to take part in that. And at the same time, you want to be demanding um, 
radical change, just as you said. And those two things collided for me on a single day when I was 20 years old. Um, And and it's just a, it's really a metaphor. Like, you know, we want, we want the radical change. We want to step off this damn conveyor belt of, of uh, contemporary life that has, that forces us to live in a certain way that we know is destructive to ourselves and to the earth itself. And yet we can't, we, we end up with the styrofoam hat on our head every day. Right. Um, and it doesn't seem like we can do very much. I mean, some people will move off the grid and some people will become vegan and some people will refuse to fly and some people will do X or Y and you, and those are really important things to do. I I am not denigrating anybody's choice to take personal action in that way. In fact, it's very powerful, but at the same time, most, the vast majority of people in this country are locked into a destructive lifestyle, a lifestyle that produces destruction to the earth. That is most of us have to drive everywhere we go because of the way American urbanism, and here's the connection to some of my other work, American urbanism has been established um, in reification to the automobile and to fossil fuels. And obviously it didn't have to go that way where we are, we're trapped into paying money to, to allow us to get from A to B rather than having set up um, our habitations and our cities and our, uh, our societies in a way that, why why do we have to pay Mm -hmm. for, for fuel to, to move us fuel that damages the earth and ourselves um, in a multitude of, why are we paying for that? Right. And enrich, and enriching, you know, a certain set of people at the expense of at the expense of everyone else. And we're trapped in that. Like there's almost no way out. Uh, this was, uh, maybe 10 years ago, but only 5%, of course, things are changed now because of COVID, but they're worse. Probably only 5% of Americans use public transportation every day. Yeah. Which tells you about how locked in we are to this particular way of living that is destructive. Well, and I think, you know, and you mentioned this in your book that 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 being locked in in that way is tied to our philosophy as citizens in the United States that goes back several hundred years (laughs) imported, you know, from colonizers with this sort of manifest destiny and conquering and independence and freedom. And I think you mentioned freedom in particular as it relates to vehicles and this ability to, you know, be unencumbered by or rest- or restricted in any way to do anything that you want. And, and that I think that my personal feeling is that it's a good marketing campaign right? By the automobile and fossil fuel industry. And it's still that you still see commercials, even for, you know, the, maybe the better vehicles, if you, if there is a better vehicle that now you can traverse the wilderness and, and experience that freedom uh, to explore. And, and so these themes I think are sort of embedded in our mentality. They're, They're absolutely embedded. I mean, in the book, I, in this book uh, is sort of an invitation to think along with me and, and in my suffering and, and, you know, really despair trying to find a way to respond to the eco crisis and the climate emergency. uh, I wrote this searching for other people's words. So throughout it, I'm, you know, kind of um, pulling on poets and writers and Mm -hmm. uh, theorists and philosophers uh, trying just, I'm really grasping at straws for anything that can help us think through this situation that we're in. And one of them is the Italian um, novelist Italo Calvino. And, and, and he, in, um, in, in some of his work was thinking about the kind of like inherent human desire for flight, to run away, to escape, mm-hmm. 
And he traces that back to Italian folk tales, which is the basis for a lot of his work. Um, and in a very real way, that is the imprint, particularly on American life. Been doing a lot of reading about the era, uh, era around the 1740s. Mm-hmm to 60s. So that's the the time of what we call the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War. And that was a moment in which colonizer, the colonization really expanded rapidly and the number of Europeans coming to this continent grew exponentially very quickly. But in that period, there was still this really dynamic negotiation between those people coming to colonize for all for all kinds of various reasons a lot of them for religious reasons and there was a moment at which there was a tremendous amount of intercommunication interreliance they were at stake to each other for survival and what but what certainly the colonizers thought was wilderness and Mm -hmm. the native people particularly along the eastern seaboard of the of the continent um, became reliant and dependent on those colonizers for certain goods that they now needed. It created a dependency, but there was a tremendous amount of interrelationship. And it wasn't clear that what was going to come out of that was the manifest destiny that you talk about. But in fact, that's exactly what happened. There was a tipping point, I guess, in which the easiest thing and the most uh, apparent thing for particularly the English colonizers to do was to overwhelm and destroy. Uh, that was how they could get rid of the French as well. Um, and, and other, uh, European colonizers and just take it for themselves. And it was all being done, uh, in the name of freedom. And it was all being done in the name of individual possibility where at some point they were able to say, lying to themselves and to everyone, you know, you as in indigenous people, you are in our way and we have the right to get rid of you and imprint upon this place, this other way of thinking. Um, And so, I mean, it really does go back to those 200, 250, 300 years, 400 years to, to that era. Yeah. And and it's interesting because I teach a class called Wildlife Conservation and American Culture, where I've expanded American to be America's as it should be. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, one of the striking things is that what what was also imported was this, um, you know, wilderness is something to be tamed and conquered and transformed into a more you know, a cultivated wilderness or cultivated nature. And then uh, the rebound with the sort of romantic view of a return to wilderness also drove and shaped the history of conservation in the United States, aside from also being, you know, rooted in a racist philosophy uh, was the notion that nature is, has to be pure nature wilderness without the imprint of humans. And so we are also influenced, I think the way that we think about nature and wilderness by those perspectives today. Uh, It's a a brilliant uh, summary. I mean, what you just made and particularly, you know, going in, It's very interesting. I talked about the English, but behind a lot of this were Germans. And it's it's interesting from our perspective because uh, where I live in Pennsylvania, the Germans were so important in sort of that first round of taming nature. And it's interesting because in the earliest um, uh, writings about uh, the wilderness here, there's just that, you know, it's wilderness and it's wild and it's difficult and it's hard to get from place to place. Um, And what they go through to do that is extraordinary hunger and putting their lives at risk. And, you know, you could fall or you could freeze to death or you could starve to death so easily. That's why you had to be reliant on the friends that you could make who were Mm -hmm. indigenous people. And you had to learn to speak their language to do that. Right. And, but somewhere in there, it flipped to the taming. And I've always wondered from the perspective of Pennsylvania, um, which is a very German 
pl- place in American history that it much of the state in my view looks an awful lot like Germany. And I always have thought like, wow, when the, those colonizers came here, did they see that? And I actually now think that they didn't see that at all. They just saw that these huge mountains and this, these rivers everywhere and um, kinds of human beings that they had never understood before they came to the continent, but they tamed it and they turned it into a version of their old so-called old world. Yes. Um, and they even named the places after those places in the old world, which is the habit. And they made it that way. They imprinted themselves so much onto the landscape that it turned it into a version of Germany in a kind of ecological way. And, yeah. and that's just a stunning realization for me. And of course, famously the sort of German romantics who, are those who came here or over there a little bit later, starting in maybe the 1820s and began to say, ah, look at that nature out there. Isn't it beautiful? (laughs) Right. Well, and so one of the things, I mean, again, so many things everybody should read to reach the spring, but I really enjoyed how you, your, your historical knowledge, the incorporation of all of these different perspectives and points of view, even as you know, we're reading your struggle to grapple with these issues. One of the things, and it ties to this sort of um, social justice that you mentioned your kids are, you know, really active in and, and uh, in a, a way that is bigger than, you know, yours or my generation. We're not that far apart, um, you know, had the capacity or wherewithal, or I don't know, to, to, we tried in, in our own way. Uh, but one of the things you talk about was uh, is this inequality of influence and how that has shaped environmental policy in the United States. So what does you know, inequality of influence mean in this context? It's a great question. It means a lot of things, I think, and not, a, not all of which I, I talked about in the book, but um, you know, on the face of it, it means that what still dominates the way we think about all of this is that German romanticism. That is, there's a nature out there to protect, to return to a pure original state for the benefit, for the aesthetic pleasure of people who can be aware enough to appreciate it. And those people, of course, are wealthy. Correct. Um, uh, there's a there's a great piece by Ian Frazier. Uh, I think it was in the New York Review of Books a few weeks ago, uh, where he's talking about the sort of environmental activists in the West. I think it was in Wyoming, uh, where the super wealthy have settled and landed in the mountains, and they have ginormous houses, you know, five thousand square foot or maybe ten thousand square foot houses, probably certainly 10,000 with, with helicopter pads and all of this, but their main interest is environmentalism. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. And that's what they spend their money on because they're protecting their aesthetic pleasure over and above everything else. And what was drawn out in this essay, a very beautiful essay was the fact that all the people who work for these people, they live in crowded, uh, overcrowded conditions and dormitories across town where they don't have good access to health care. And we can go down the list of things like that. And the rich people don't even recognize that as a problem. They don't see the connection. Yeah. And, and so that right there is inequality of influence. I mean, at the very most basic level, some of those people are most certainly connected to the fossil fuel industry because it's a it's an industry that has created enormous wealth for not just an oligar- oligarchical top tier, but for a, a second tier that is itself wealthier than any other tier of human beings in the history of the planet Earth. And um And those people have, however, I mean, if there are 8 billion humans on the planet, let's guess there are a million, Mm -hmm. like, really wealthy, I don't know, that's probably not an accurate number, it's probably much more than that, let's say 10 million, if there are 8 billion, let's say 10 million, like, super wealthy people connected to the fossil fuel and petrochemical industries in, in, uh, 
you know, Europe and America and Asia, South America, uh, those people have an inequality of influence over what's happening here. Uh, in, in the United States, of course, uh, the C- Citizens United, a decision by the Supreme Court, basically granted uh, humanhood to uh, corporations mm-hmm. uh, and in the guise of, under the guise of uh, freedom of expression, really damaging decision by the Supreme Court uh, and not only damaging for um, our political system, but for the very notion of freedom of expression, I believe it's really distorted things. And so, I mean, that's what the inequality of influence is. I mean, you know, you talked about being, you know, World Wildlife Fund and Nature Conservancy and all these groups that, you know, you and I came of age in that were, I work for the PERGs as a canvas director, some of which I talk about in this book. Yes. These, um, you know, earlier environmental organizations, which a lot of people have given a bad name to in part, some of them, some of that's because of the kind of like dilettante environmentalism of the wealthy, but also because they've been seen to be ineffective in trying to fight off uh, climate, the climate emergency, or, you know, really make change in that regard. And in the era in which they've been most active, things have gotten exponentially worse. So people sort of poo poo those organizations and their self-righteousness, but you know, those organizations are like spitting in the wind compared to the influence of petrochemical industries influence on us as consumers influence on the government and, and policy decisions across the whole globe so that's the inequality of influence like what those companies can spend and do spend to distort reality to their benefit it just overwhelms what any single person or even a group of organized people can do to stop it Greta Thunberg being a great example of that you know she is like out there as a a prophetess of this moment. And you just get the sense of her, even given how much she has done in creating things, you know, leading things like the green new deal and the climate strikes across the world, extinction rebellion, all of these amazing things. It's still a tiny voice crying in the wind. Yes, it is. And so, you know, circling back to when I was growing up and, you know, coming of age and the commitment I had, you know, something happened along the way, right? You get your degrees, you get your job, you, you get caught up in the wheel or the circle of, Mm -hmm. of living in the construct that we have. And, and at this, and, and then at some point you, me, you know, go, Hey, wait a second, what happened to that person? who was the, the Greta Mm -hmm. of her time, (laughs) Mm -hmm. where where did that go and how do I reconnect with that? And, and one of the things that has struck me is I, I wonder how much influence do we really have as individuals? And so how can you talk, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's, I mean, I totally uh, connect with what you just said, Jennifer. I think that's actually part of why I wrote this Mm -hmm. was, um, I think I started writing it uh, as I was about to turn 50. I've dated myself twice in this conversation. (laughs) We're (laughs) close. uh, We're very close. (laughs) (laughs) And um, um, and it was partially that, like what happened to that thing that was so part of your life? You went ahead and had a family and, you know, became a writer for whatever reason and did all of these things. But what about that thing that really you started with that was this deep concern, this passion for uh, the environment, for the earth? And so I think that's part of the reason why I wrote this book. And, and a lot of this book is about thinking through the question of the individual. Mm-hmm amidst the collective, um, partially because we are each of us moral beings. So like we try to do right. I mean, most of us do. Yes. And I mean, 
I, I talk about this situation in relation to Nazi Germany. I mean, the banality of evil was about regular people who thought they were doing right by supporting the Nazi party and going along with what was going on. It was, it was, it was just something that you could rationalize or even support um, mm-hmm. with agency. And that's what w- each of us is kind of doing, we're really, com- especially, you know, each of us who is wealthy enough to mm-hmm. have such an impact as almost all Americans do, not all, of course, uh, given the l- extraordinary levels of income inequality in this country, but across uh, so much of Europe, America, and Asia, uh, a vast, vast numbers of people are complicit in in a system, in systems, economic and political, that are causing the certain destruction of the earth, species, ecosystems, systems, the oceans. I mean, the list is long and we really don't know what we're doing. We're so damn sloppy in the way we act. So we're part of this mass thing, yet we're each we're each a part of it. So we're each as an individual choosing to act in a certain way. So, and how do we make sense of it? Because really we can also say to each other, well, Jennifer, it doesn't matter what you do. If you want to go visit your friends in Japan, go ahead. You know, if you want to go make a cross country a road trip and finally go, you know, go drive to the, um, to the desert in California or something. You've never done that. You want to like, right. Why shouldn't you? Of course you should. But, um, but at the same time, because of course that's not going to have it, you know, whatever carbon you emit and doing that is relatively small, but yet we're all doing it as part of this larger thing. And we know that as we contribute to that, we're at fault. Yes. We're complicit. And so it's an, for me in writing this book, I felt this unbearable weight that I was trapped into living in a way that was causing me to do harm to future generations, which I couldn't figure out. You, I was a philosophy major, you know, thinking through uh, ethical philosophy, how to take account for the damage I might be doing to future generations and to non-human beings, which is a whole other element in philosophy. Um I, I just don't know. And so like trying to think through what that means in being complicit to something that is so vast in time scale and space scale and beyond actual, you know, it's not like I'm going out and killing someone, you know, where there's a clear, you know, a clear action with a clear path, mm-hmm. an action and an object and an outcome where I've done something clearly illegal and immoral and I should be punished for it. This is a little bit different. It's so much more diffuse and yet it's also so, so real. The people who are suffering from the various climate emergencies that are going on around the world, the creatures who, you know, the, 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 the coral reefs, which are animals that are dying. Who's causing that? Well, you and me are. I know. I know. And, you know, so one of the things um, that I'm wondering, and you mentioned about how you're, you try to also be careful when you talk to your kids, right? So that they're not overwhelmed by this sense of oh, hopelessness mm-hmm. about what's happening. But then you also talked about in the book, this paralysis, this sort of, you know, inaction collectively and even for, for some individually. And when I think about, you know, I'm very privileged to, to try to investigate, you know, where things are coming from and make decisions. And and then I get overwhelmed with every decision I make is actually having a negative impact. Even if I try to make the best decisions in as many areas, there's something I don't know. Or even if I know I don't, I can't exist in this space without contributing. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, do you think that 
that that this uh, paralysis that you talk about is a consequence of butting up against the reality of I live, I cause damage. There is no way to escape that. I'm completely overwhelmed with all of the impacts that I and collectively we have on the earth and every other living thing in it and on each other, that there is no choice for me to make that will stop that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly it. I mean, so I think the paralysis comes from what you described, which is what we are facing individually is beyond what the individual can do Mm -hmm. anything about. And at the same time, so there's this like mismatch in a kind of moral and ethical construct is that, you know, if you are like, like the classic moral tale of, um, uh, what's the Dickens tale at Christmas time? Um, Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is the famous guy who's a, a total jerk? And um, wow. Scrooge? Scrooge. No. So, okay. So you, yeah, there it is. So, you know, Scrooge was an asshole and he made, he made a lot of people's lives suffer. But then, thanks to his own imminent death, he had a, an awakening moment and he sought to rectify all the damages he had done. Mm -hmm. And so, wow, well, that's a nice moral tale that you can fix what you screwed up. But the fact is when you're very, when the very act of living means destruction in a way that you can't exactly put your finger on because a, you don't understand it well enough. B the outcomes are, you know, three or four, generations away i don't mean time generation generations but i mean sequences of events away like what i if i drive the car it creates the emissions the emissions uh warm the glaciers the glaciers melt the melting glaciers acidify the ocean you know etc 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 it's a long mm-hmm. chain of events from me just driving to the grocery store <laughs> correct um, yeah and so it's really that So there's a way in which we're both, we can tell ourselves just like the Nazis did that what we're doing isn't wrong and what we're doing is so diffuse, it's hard to put a finger on exactly what is it is. And when we're most aware and most conscious of what it is, of all of these outcomes, we still have a hard time putting our finger exactly on how to change. Mm-hmm. And because of the structures, the systems of economy and government and politics, we are trapped in a way of living in this country that demands of you the total, um, the the total lack of agency in regard to the automobile and to fossil fuels. And if you are going to take that on personally and defy it, Mm -hmm. well, first of all, very soon in some States, you could be put in jail if you try to protest against fossil fuel industry. So that's a very interesting thought. But if you try to do it by say, moving off the grid and changing your lifestyle, you, you could, you know, you don't go anywhere. I don't know how that's possible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, You get off the grid, you eat vegan, you um, don't use any plastics, including in your clothing, because of course, microplastics is an astounding issue uh, of environmental concern. Like you could choose to do all of those things, but think how much it would take to do all that. Right. Um, And for what exactly? Mm -hmm. Just to demonstrate that you are pure and more um, morally upright than the next guy. Like, so it's all of this weighs down and is causing that paralysis. Well, and and so, so I want to now kind of try to, because that's so important because I think that the average person who does care and we, you, you talk about that sort of like good people try to make good decisions and, and want to cooperate and want to help. And then when you go through that list of what you just said, it's like, well, okay, I can't do all of that. And <laughs> it's not even going to matter if I do all of that. So what's the point? And I think I'd like to, you know, kind of turn that corner, which I know you, you do 
also in the, in the book of, okay, what can we do? And, and for this, I want to kind of talk about a little story you told about going to a lakeside house after five months being yeah. absent <laughs> <laughs> and how you discovered that nature's really messy. And, and it kind of ties back to that cultivated landscape, right? So, so why do you think we want so much cultivated naturalistic space around us, but not really nature? Yeah. I mean, so I think that one of the things that it, I don't know, there's a, there's no great way to answer the question of, you know, how to be in 2021 in regard to the climate emergency. Like, I don't know what it is. Yeah. There's a part of us human beings that desires, that loves life. We love life. We love the sun. We love to walk in the open space. We love to hear the birds. We love to swim in the ocean. We love to plant a garden. We like to hike in the mountains. We like to um, laugh and eat really good food. Mm-hmm. We like, la- you know, we love to eat fresh food, even though Americans are really not very good at that, uh, despite everything. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, so so one might just say, like, the only thing you can do is is love life because life is what it's all about. And if you're doing that, it's good enough. And 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 that's part of it. So and and there's part of the answer as to, well, God, what do I do about this? Mm -hmm. That is that I would say is like, well, connect to nature. Nature will tell you connect to nature in the way you know how to connect to nature, or you like to connect to nature, or it feels good to connect to nature because in order for us to want to even care about any of this, we have to be connected to things that are non-human that actually makes us feel really good as human beings at, at a, a really deep level, mm-hmm. but it also, it puts us at, at stake to that non-human world that needs us to be at stake to it. I think um, otherwise we just punish it and punish it and punish it. And so, but how we do that, I mean, so you, the example that you raised, <laughs> I talk about, um, uh, my wife's family has a house on a lake that we have used a lot over the years. It's a beautiful place to go, to get out of the city away from right now. I'm listening to sirens, uh, you know, sitting here in, in my house in the city and to get away from the noise and to hike a lot, walk mm-hmm. out of the house and just walk into the woods and all of those wonderful, terrific things, which of course require you to drive to them, but there you go. And um, I, for some reason, we skipped the whole summer going to that house. And I went there in October. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about like the Northeast America where fall has come and, uh, you know, the, the, the temperatures are falling and the garden, which I've been cultivating a perennial garden for 20 years there is just overgrown the weeds are out of control (laughs) the um vines are climbing up all over the house onto this like window screens and you know doing destructive things to the windows and um it is just a mess even inside i find a cabinet that is covered in mold yeah (laughs) Um, and it's like whole and there's absolutely the odor of a decomposing rodent that I have to find it and get rid of it. And so I think I spend three hours on the assault taming all of this so that I can then enjoy being there. Right. Nature happened and you cleaned it up. <laughs> and I cleaned it up. So help me in the, in the, I mean, that I can tell you that to reach the spring, the book we're talking about, I began writing about a month before this happened. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're really torn. We're really at odds in the way we think about this. I am in that moment. I am the German romanticist othering nature <laughs> so that it can be aesthetically pleasing to me. 
And that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And, you know, look, I agree with everything that you said about, you know, the, the way that people can do something is to connect to nature in the way that, that they feel connected to that. And, and at the same time, your, your story about taming this wild nature that took over in these months that you were absent, in, in this case, it was really lighthearted and, and, and important as a, um, sort of a lens to look through this bigger issue that I see a lot that also happened to me here where I am. I, I take these walks and I discovered a beaver and I was very excited mm-hmm. um, that there was a beaver afoot and I was going to set up my little remote camera and try to, mm-hmm. you know, be a peeping Tom on the beaver. And I just, I, I loved seeing all the pencil sticks <laughs> all over the place uh, is what it looked like as sharpened mm-hmm. pencil mm-hmm. sticks. And then the landscaping company. So this is a very wealthy area that I go to, to walk. Cause there's a lot of trees, which is mm-hmm. also, we could talk about that too, that, that how wealthy areas actually have yes. more trees. <laughs> Very apparent uh, in the city where I live. Yeah. And so I, I choose to go there to walk because there's more birds and there's more you know, bees and butterflies. And then there was this beaver, but it started building, a, uh, you know, this little lodge or supply before winter and the landscaping company, I guess, came to clean up nature mm-hmm. and it cleaned up the beaver's stash. And I was devastated because I know what this meant for the beaver. And then ever resilient beaver crossed the street, moved to the other side, started again. Mm -hmm. I was encouraged, Mm -hmm. but that side took it to the highway and it got hit. And I, 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 for five days, every time I drove Mm -hmm. and I saw that beaver, I was just, upset at this idea that why did you have to clean up what was happening? It wasn't a mess. It was a part of the, like how wonderful that even what we've cultivated would create an opportunity for a home for this beaver. And why couldn't you just let it be? And maybe they didn't know what it was and, or maybe they don't like to see twigs piled up. You know, I don't know, but in the end I recruited Maybe the pandemic does strange things to people. I said, anybody want to help me bury a body? (laughs) And multiple people act without knowing it was a beaver. (laughs) said, sure. And so me and two people went because I couldn't stand the idea of this beaver just, you know, being either thrown in the dump or laying by the side of the road forever. And so we fetched her. It turned out it was a her. Mm -hmm. And I decided to bury her near where she had lived. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I felt finally somehow better, Uh, you know, even though she was gone, I felt like she just wasn't trashed by the side of the road anymore. Yeah. Such a great story. Um, And there's so many things about it that pique my attention. Like for one, what you just did mattered to you more than to the beaver. Correct. Who was dead. And yet that's really so important. Like we have to find ways to feel connected and to feel like, like what happens out there matters. Mm-hmm. So we tell stories. You told a story that an injustice was done to this poor creature. And, um, and you, and you wanted to find a way to recognize that injustice and, and you did a beautiful, you made a beautiful gesture and you felt better because then you felt more connected. And actually you probably had learned a lot about the way beavers act. Um, in, you know, they're sort of tenacious. Yes. I mean, when you first started talking about the beaver, I mean, I thought of the, my very, my own, like <laughs> battles with the beaver on that same property I was talking about earlier, where, I mean, the beaver had taken down the willow tree, the pussy willow trees and the viburn, the cranberry viburnum that I had planted. <laughs> and like the beaver had done that. And I wasn't very happy with the beaver about all those things. But I also think about this, you know, that beaver is having an extraordinary impact on the environment. Yeah. That beaver is altering the environment in a very substantial way, just as you or I do. 
And so it's really important for us to remember that, you know, ants, there's so many creatures, they're not living innocuously. Mm -hmm. They are altering the environment just like we do. And it's not just, you know, not just like us rich uh, Western humans do, uh, us colonizers, but all human beings also alter the environment in substantial ways. The thing I talk about in the book is um, that when the conquistadores went to the Americas Mm -hmm. and the effect of them doing so caused genocide among the indigenous people living there, they did such, I mean, they killed 50 or 50 million or maybe a hundred million people. Um, through smallpox and other diseases like that, Mm -hmm. why that caused an extraordinary reforestation in the Americas, which would become unforestation very quickly as the Europeans got to work. But for a moment, for a moment, the earth cooled because the forest came back because those indigenous people were gone to such a degree and though they weren't innocuous people, they were destructive people because all animals do destruction and make change. And we have to, we have to understand that there's no purity on earth. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that might be a way for us to think about what we do, not to let us ourselves off the hook, but to also know that we are part of it. Nature isn't, exterior from us it's part of what we who we are and what we are and what we are doing here is acting like animals Mm -hmm. well and i think something that you said that's really powerful is you know there's also this romanticized view that indigenous people don't have any impact on the landscape and and i think that one of the things that that what that does is take away from the reality that they have a perspective of relating mm-hmm. ecologically and living responsibly with the environment and with other animals. And when we sort of romanticize this idea that they were, they had no impact, we ignore uh, the, 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 the way that they interacted. And I think that in many places, there's a return to this and this ties to another project that I just want to touch on that you're involved in. But, but I think that having a more integrated intersectional experience of our relationship with the environment is something that we can learn from indigenous people and letting them have a voice at, at the table of things that impact them and sharing their knowledge and sharing their experience, even though it, it, it you know, we have a very westernized perspective of the word science. (laughs) Um, but, but science is a way of knowing and they have ways of knowing. And I think that looking to that can be helpful for how we can move forward. And I think something that I was really interested in, if you, I know you have to go and you're very busy and we've, I've, I've really, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> um, but you started, uh, you were involved in, or started in 2019, a program called the Valley of the possible. Um, yes. And I really would love to know more about this and have you share with the listeners what this program is, because yeah. I yep. think it kind of ties to what we were just talking about a little bit. Well, you hit on it. Um, So there really is a real issue here with, and it goes all the way back to colonization in the Americas about the romanticizing and othering of indigenous people happened immediately. There was fear, some respect, some complete misunderstanding and, you know, it's, it's a dynamic situation. So indigenous people are responding to European people at, this in, at the same time. But what it ends up happening in effect, as we all well know, is that the colonizers basically just, um, they discount indigenous knowledge from, the, from jump, as a friend of mine likes to say. Mm-hmm. And there's a gr- really great anecdote in 1750s when general washington is a young soldier but he's been put in charge of strategy during the seven years war for the english army 
for his majesty. Um, Washington is, you know, somewhere in Pennsylvania or maybe what is now Michigan, somewhere out in Ohio, somewhere around there and is, uh, been given some native peoples. I think they were Shawnee to be part of his forces and Washington, instead of listening to the indigenous people's knowledge about the territory or how to fight Mm -hmm. in that territory or how to survive in that place, he refuses to, and he purposely does not listen to them. He doesn't think that they're truly human beings, of course. And so by completely discounting their knowledge and their expertise, he causes himself and his army and his men a great deal of vulnerability and damage. Uh, And there was one indigenous person who said, you know, immediately he basically treated us like slaves Mm -hmm. rather than listening to our knowledge. And so this is deep, deep within us, this whole notion of discounting indigenous understanding of what it means to live on earth. Mm -hmm. These are people who lived here and they didn't, as we just said, they were destructive. They lived like all animals do, all humans do in destructive ways, but in ways that were vastly different uh, at an, at a just basic theoretical level about how to live on earth. Mm -hmm. And instead of listening and learning, which almost kind of happened for a little while, we discounted and in in essence, of course, tried to shut it out and cover it up and bury it, pretend it never existed. Correct. The Valley of the Possible, which is in southern Chile, almost all the way to Patagonia, was started by a Dutch couple um, who basically sought to change their lives, a couple in their mid-30s. who decided to change everything and create a space for a new kind of learning and being on earth. They found a place to do that in Southern Chile in South America and discovered in this, their own quest for a new way um, that they had themselves to learn from the people who were indigenous to that place who are called Mapuche. Mm-hmm. Mapuche people, in essence, a great, a very uh, high percentage of Argentinians and Chileans are Mapuche by origin uh, because the Mapuche people and the Pehuenche people were or related or, or part of the same set of indigenous um, nations, in essence, were um, the last to be colonized by the Spanish in, in, the, in the Americas. The Spanish could not cross over the Bio Bio River because it was such a ferocious river until the 19th century, well into the 19th century. And then at that point, when they finally got across and they kept pushing the frontera further and further to the south because more and more Europeans of from all different places, French, Spanish, Irish, English, Scottish, German, Austrian, wherever they were coming to escape a difficult life in Europe and come to South America, they kept pushing and pushing further south and eventually really truly colonized the Mapuche people, which took place over the late 19th century and, and into the 20th century, but in a way that's still happening today. It's It's live. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Chilean um, politics over the last year and a half, there's been actually a huge economic and social revolution in Chile. It is very much tied into the quest for Mapuche rights. Um, And so when the Valley of the Possible was set up, I was one of the first residents. I was part of the first cohort of residents of artists who came down, um, who went down. That's, I guess, a very... uh, colonizing way of thinking about it we went there Mm -hmm. to southern chile and um they uh, we were allowed the space to listen and learn from mapuche historians mapuche ecologists uh, mapuche uh, political revolutionaries to learn about the way they see 
themselves and life on earth, the way they relate to the rivers, the way they relate to the Arakaria tree, which is one of the oldest kinds of trees on earth. It was around in the dinosaur era and is endangered right now. So we were able to learn about the way that they conceive of life and they are fighting tooth and nail to make real this conception of life on earth for human beings while um, multinational corporations and the neoliberal political state of Chile, which is one of the most conservative and business friendly on earth is running roughshod over all of the elements of the Mapuche inheritance, which are the trees, which is the rivers, the Bio Bio itself, that ferocious river has now been dammed nine times and basically wow. been lobotomized from being a, a play. Uh, like if you were to say, what is the mother of the Mapuche people? You might say it was the Bio Bio. You might say it was the Arcaria tree, but there's a way in which these elements were real in their lives. They have real spirits and they've all been so substantially destroyed the forest replaced with uh, eucalyptus plantations, uh, which sucks the life out of the earth. So, yeah, so this is all real. And the thing about the Mapuche resistance to all of this is that it is a resistance to the colonization that isn't from the 19th century in India, isn't from the 17th century in the Americas, isn't from the 16th century in the Americas. We're not talking about conquistadores anymore. We're talking about governments and multinationals and uh, lumber companies and paper manufacturers and uh, companies that uh, um, provide hydroelectric energy um, that are now the colonizers of this world. But in talking to Mapuche people, they also know that they have a leg up on us, the rest of us, because they actually know how to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think that aside from, so first, thank you for sharing that and sharing that with the listeners. And I think that, you know, aside from becoming more educated, where people can become more educated on, on even what it would mean to facilitate and engage in and participate in decolonization, understanding that, that the suffering that indigenous people are experiencing when they are forcibly disconnected from everything that gives them life and contributes to their mental, physical, and mm -hmm. emotional and spiritual well-being is exactly the same things that do that for us. For everyone that's not an indigenous person and is living on this earth and and basically these things will happen to us, to all of us. And I hope that people after reading your book to reach the spring, not only have a deeper understanding of some of the, the events and histories and ways that our approach or interaction with the environment has been influenced in, in a multitude of ways, but really reflect because that is something that comes out of the book is this, reflection on who, who you are, how you're moving in the world and what you can do about it. And so I'm so thankful for having this, had this time with you to talk about these things and really thank you for being on the show. Well, I mean, I want to thank you, Jennifer, because um, if all of your shows are, you know, this caring and this reflective and this thoughtful and this open and revealing then you know it's just a, a wonderful thing that you're doing because we've got to have these conversations you are hosting them you are making them possible and that's this has just been a, a great conversation i've been really happy to and enjoyed hearing your perspective on all of this i'm no scientist <laughs> and you know just hearing your own struggles um yeah. the about the beaver i mean it's so moving and important for us to talk about this stuff because it's real yeah. And, and we're all at some level feeling this to me, I think things that we, we see happening socially and politically, I believe are a reflection of our disconnection from each other and from nature. And that is one of the motivations for doing this show. So to have those conversation and to maybe inspire people 
to do something different. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you got it. It's why, right. it's, it's why I wrote this book. Same reason. Yes, I know. And that's why it impacted me so much. So, so a real treat and, and thank you. Thanks for having me. As we wrap up today's episode, I'm reminded of the beautiful chaos of nature. It's messy, unpredictable, and endlessly fascinating. Perhaps instead of trying to impose order upon it, we can learn to embrace the ordered, organized chaos of the natural world. Before we part ways, I want to give you a glimpse of what's to come. In our next episode, we'll be joined by Leah Rampey, author of the new book, Earth and Soul. Her book emphasizes the profound connection between humanity and nature, which lies at the heart of our existence. It's a perfect continuation of the themes we've explored today and a reminder of our deep intrinsic bond that we have with this planet during Earth Week, Earth Day. I'm going to call it Earth Month. Okay, I'm going to sign off, but one more piece of exciting news. Thanks to the support of the U.S. Embassy in Kampala through the Department of State, in addition to the Mountain Gorilla work, I'm launching a new environmental education project in Uganda focused on tackling plastic pollution. This initiative will connect students in the U.S. with their peers in Uganda to collaboratively address this pressing issue. If you'd like to support this project or contribute to our other conservation efforts, please visit wildconnection.org or my website and click on donate. Remember, all donations are tax deductible and go towards education, conservation, and community engagement. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RealDrJen in order to keep up with what's happening with the mountain gorillas and what's happening with this project. Thanks for listening. 